All right, hello everyone, and thank you for attending the webinar, Discovering A10 Networks, Taking Application Delivery Control and Server Load Balancing to the Next Level. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type them into the questions section on the menu bar, and our speaker will address them um, as the presentation goes or at the end. All right, um, let's get started. I am going to hand it over to Jay Gottsman. He is um, of 810 Networks, and we will get started. Jay, go ahead. Oh, we seem to be having just a little bit of a technical difficulty here. Um, just hold on one moment. Sorry, everyone, just hold on one moment. We are um, attempting to get this started here, having a little bit of te technical difficulty, so just sit tight one moment. All right, Jay, uh, looks like we are all set if you want to get started. We should be able to hear you now. So sorry about the delay, everyone. Yeah, that was, that was probably on my, an error on my part. Apologize, everybody, for the delay. Uh, again, this is Jay Gottsman. I'm the Regional Sales Director for A10 Networks here in Illinois. And uh, my counterpart is also on the phone, Lynn Summerlot, who's a senior system engineer. Uh, Lynn has been with the company for a bit over five years, myself a little bit over two years. So we appreciate you taking the time to learn a little bit more about A10, uh, what we're doing, why we're here, and the success that we've been seeing. 
the, I'd like to kind of walk you through why we are here. Uh, let me. It starts a little bit with the background of our organization. That starts with our CEO, Lee Chin. Uh, Lee was one of the pioneers of the load balancing industry. Uh, he's been involved with uh, several different startup companies as co-founders, and A10 was the first organization that he founded solely. And it really was predicated on the idea of building a system that was quite a bit different than what the market was accustomed to. When he was one of the uh, co-founders of Foundry Networks, he was the VP of Engineering, and he developed Foundry's uh, load balancing platform at the time. And this was in the later part of the 90s when really the whole industry grew up. Um, and uh, so he had, a, he had visibility into how everybody was going to market, how they were constructing their hardware, and, uh, and quite honestly, he, he built his platform along similar premises to basically how, the mark, how everybody was going to market. Flash forward about four or five years post the dot-com bubble, and he had, um, he had the opportunity to take a look at the market kind of in the rearview mirror, and he felt that there was inefficiencies in which the platforms were being designed. There was inaccuracies, uh, there were deficiencies in the performance, and he felt if he could isolate that, um, there were ways in which he could transform the industry. So he actually uh, he incorporated A10. He left Foundry and incorporated A10 in late 2004. And that platform that he had envisioned from an R&D perspective took him the better part of three plus years to build. Uh, since that's happened, um, they began shipping revenue of their what's now called application delivery controller, which uh, load balancing is a function within the application delivery controller. Uh, but since he's done that, um, they started shipping revenue in late 2008. They did about $7 million. Um, but because of the technology, because of the disruptive nature of it, in a relatively short period of time, the company has grown very rapidly. We exited out of 2013 doing about $170 million. So uh, I probably need to update that slide. I think we're about 650 employees right now. And we're adding about 200 this year to support the growth that we're seeing. So some other highlights from 2013. Market share, we're, about, we're number three globally. We actually moved into the number one slot in Japan uh, about uh, towards the, um, uh, I guess it was about four months ago. We're the only challenger in the Magic Quadrant. To give you a little background of how we came to market when we first entered the space, we spent a lot of energy and time in the, with those organizations that required uptime and high performance, and that was the service provider market. We then bled into kind of the Web 2.0, if you will, and had a lot of success there as well. And then as we entered into the enterprise, you know, a couple, three years ago, uh, we began to, began to have to play, you know, the games of uh, or spending time with organizations like Gartner and things so they understood what, where we were coming from, where we were going. And in a very short period of time, we've, we've risen probably the most, well, we have risen the most aggressively in the Gartner Magic Quadrant. Uh, as I mentioned there, we're the only challenger, and we think we'll probably be in the leadership category, if not this year, certainly by next year. So to give you some idea of uh, where we're playing in the space, today we're primarily going to be discussing around the ADC, but there are a couple other areas and markets that we play in with uh, uh, some of our other platforms. Uh, the second line would be our carrier-grade NAT or large-scale NAT um, for uh, IPv4 NAT extension and IPv migration solutions. A lot of success there in the, uh, in the carrier space, uh, companies like um, T-Mobile, uh, Verizon, for example, are a couple that uh, come to mind, some of the larger carriers, NTT Docomo in, in Japan, the three largest carriers over there. The third one is around uh, our TPS product line, and this is, a, uh, this is a newer platform for us around DDoS detection and mitigation. Uh, this was a, a joint development effort with Microsoft, who's a large customer of ours. Uh, we do Xbox Live with Microsoft and traditional kind of load balancing. Xbox One, we're doing uh, the DDoS mitigation, uh, and Azure rollout, we're doing DDoS mitigation. So we have a very strong relationship with Microsoft. They were reaching some limitations with their DDoS mitigation platform, and uh, having known us and known how, how we've architected our platform, they felt that if we could develop some software around, around this platform and leverage the technology that we have, 
that they could uh, that they could significantly enhance their um, their DDoS mitigation capabilities. Uh, so we're seeing about 4x the performance of the leaders in this marketplace in this space, uh, and our costs are about the third. So uh, very attractive platform. We're real excited about rolling that out. But that's for a different day, uh, where we're spending the uh, majority of our conversation on today is around the ADC, and this gives you just kind of a holistic view of the areas where we where we kind of play um, just from a snapshot perspective. The two bubbles kind of down below is where we're going to be spending our time around uh, SLB, caching, SSL offload, web application firewall, uh, things around SSL. All right, so why do we have success and what did we have to do to have this success? It really comes down to real three disruptive areas. One is the architecture. Uh, We'll allude to this a little bit more, but what are we doing that's unique? What took him a while to design three and a half plus years? Second is disrupting the go-to-market model. How have we? How has the market been serviced? What have you been accustomed to? What can we do that's different to create a different end user experience, hopefully a better end user experience? And three is around disrupting the design, a lot around virtualization. What are we doing in the virtualization? Virtualization is kind of that nebulous, almost kind of cloud word. It means different things to different people, but what are we doing um, and what kind of end user experience are we creating with that? So let's start with the architecture. Um, Colleen, I'm going to have you let uh, Lynn also speak. I'll kick it off here, but if you want to take him off mute. Um, around the architecture, we've been doing 64-bit for over four years now. Uh, this unleashes um, performance capabilities in our systems. Much of the marketplace is just getting there in the last year or so. They began to do it. Um, ours is baked. It's seasoned. Uh, the platforms are server class, solid state drive, ECC memory, uh, latest generation Intel chipsets, so very geared towards performance and accuracy. Things around the, uh, the operating system, I, uh, Lynn, are you on? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? I can, yep. Cool. So let me kick this over to Lynn. He can talk a little bit more about what's, uh, what's unique about the architecture. Yeah, and Jay kind of alluded to this already, or described it. You always like to steal my thunder anyway. <laughs> I'll take it a little bit deeper here. So as, as Jay said, our founder basically, um, since he was one of the developers of the industry and designed the first server iron products for Foundry, he knows, obviously, the limitations of what is out there. And what he saw was that as they built out the platforms and added more and more capability, they had to add more CPUs. As they added more CPUs, they would add a dedicated bank of memory to each one. So what that does is not only add to the complexity of the hardware and the cost, but more importantly, it adds to how these banks, those banks of memory have to communicate. They use a process called IPC, which is short for interprocessing communication. So what happens is one CPU handles a, 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 a connection street from a client coming in. Now that information for where the information was sent, persistency, load, et cetera, has to be shared across all those different banks of memory so all the CPUs can see that. So there's a lot of wasted resources, a lot of extra time and overhead required for that information that to be transferred and shared across those different CPUs and memory banks. And it also adds inaccuracy. Because if you think about it, traffic is still flowing while information is being shared across all the different banks of memory. So as they make a decision, now they need to update the next one, next one, and inaccuracies occur. And if you go to the next slide, Jay, so Lee's vision was to fix this, we needed a shared memory architecture. And that's exactly what he developed, and that's what took the three years to do it. So there is no memory duplication. There is no interprocessing communication. So it's very, very efficient. So all the CPUs are writing to the same bank of memory. Less overhead, uh, no, um, no lag as far as you know, getting that type of information. So it's very, very efficient. And the next slide actually, I think, does a really good job of showing side by side how those two different processes work and how efficient the A10 architecture is. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. I appreciate that. No problem. 
So the second piece of this, when we talk about disrupting the go-to-market, it's around the licensing. So if you're familiar with this space at all, uh, really since inception, the to turn up on these solutions, you purchase additional licenses. And with that, there's capital expenditure as well as an operational expenditure. This can obviously, it can get pretty costly, and as um, uh, most of us who maybe start out day one, we, we purchase a platform for a specific functionality, and then we find that as our business needs grow or change, we want to add functionality to it. We have to seek additional capital. We then have to manage the support contract that goes along with it. We look at, we look at licensing as management of additional systems or, or platforms, if you will. They may all reside on the same physical hardware, but at the end of the day, when you have to make, when you have to um, spend capital, going operational expenditures, to us that's additional product. What A10 did is, one is the architecture, as Lynn alluded to earlier, allows us to collapse a lot of performance into a very uh, streamlined system. All of our platforms are one RU. Um, what we're doing in one RU, our competitors are having to do in chassis. And the second thing we did is, we're doing away with the licensing model. Uh, the, all features are included in the upfront acquisition of the platform. So you can see we streamline the cost substantially. So there's a capital cost that's incurred on the hardware platform, and then there's an operational cost, a support contract that also accompanies that, and that's it. And as we roll out new features, those are also included via software download. Uh, or software upgrade to the platform, if you will. Provide you have a support contract, you get to take advantage of that. So it does a number of things. Um, again, we're the new generation kind of coming through, so you know we, we've got the luxury of uh, not being beholden to the old ways of doing business. And as a result, we're seeing 30, 80 percent plus, depending on the number of licenses or features that you may look to acquire from a competitor. Um, in terms of price uh, savings. Um, as we alluded to, your capital and operational expenditures become fixed. We've got a much smaller footprint where data center uh, real estate's a premium, uh, less power consumption, the host of things that go along with there, and I, I won't read everything to you, but there's a lot of benefits to, uh, to the model. The, um, and there were, there were a few other areas that uh, we spent a lot of time early on trying to understand what was important to our customers, um, what, they, what they would like to see uh, in a quote-unquote perfect world, if you will, if there is such a thing. But a uh, couple things is we've lowered, obviously, our, our hardware costs um, and throw licensing on top of it. We've got significant, significant reduction in costs, which also ultimately leads to lower support costs. Um, from a scripting perspective, some of you may be aware of things that exist in the industry. Um, iRules is one that might come uh, to mind, but basically it's the ability to program the devices to function certain ways that may not be exactly native to the platform, but through a scripting language you can ask the, the platform to behave a certain way. Um, ours are tickle-based. Uh, I mentioned iRules. You can actually cut and paste iRules into our platform. We call ours Aflex. But one of the things we also did is we, uh, we added another level of support on that, that we fully support that. Meaning if you ever need to write a, a, um, an AFLEX, you can call our TAC organization or our engineer, your, your, uh, your engineer. They'll either help you write it or write it for you and send it to you. For some of our larger customers, we, uh, we were listening to uh, what they were saying around the, the ongoing operational costs, and we developed a volume support. And volume support is simply the market is built upon support costs are a calculation off of list cost. Um, what volume support does is for our customers who hit different spend clip levels and whether they hit that year one or year five, doesn't matter anywhere in between or later, once they have hit a certain spend level, they move into a volume support category. And we have three of them. Um, then it becomes a percentage or net or acquisition. So we significantly reduced uh, the cost of some of our larger customers, or the ongoing operational costs, literally 
to the tunes of hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars as, uh, as you projected out over three and five years. And then the gold release uh, was something that we started with the service provider market and we found that the enterprise um, has come to, uh, to enjoy it as well. It basically is we take a version of code about every 18 months and on that version of code we, we lock it. We're not going to do any new feature updates to it. We'll do um, bug fixes, security fixes as needed to it, but that code will be locked for a minimum of four years. So if you're on that code, You'll never call our TAC organization and they'll tell you, hey, we need to, um, you need to upgrade your code before we can support you if it's in that window of at least four years. Um, customers like subscribing to, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, but at the end of the day, it really gives customers choice. If they want to take advantage of a feature or upgrade the system to do something, they're more than welcome to do it. If they're happy with what they're doing today and they don't want to touch it, it's nice to have the peace of mind to know that they don't have to touch it for at least four years. And the third area we were talking about was around, um, was around virtualization. And in our world, there's three kinds of virtualizations. Um, there's a soft appliance, which rides on top of a hypervisor. And we support all the basically major hypervisors out there, VMware, K KVMs, and Hyper-V. Um, and absolutely perfect, uh, perfectly fine deployment strategy, depending on what your network requirements are. Uh, in any kind of shared resource environment, there can be trade-offs and uh, performance and certain features. That's something we usually go through from a discovery perspective when we have conversations with you. Um, if you wish to have that independent license model and have all the performance capabilities, we also have dedicated hardware where we have the virtual soft appliance right on top of. And in that environment, you get to take, you can have each virtual instance maximizing the performance case of capabilities of our hardware platform. And the third one, which is um, system segmentation or partitioning, it's layer three virtualization. This is where we have the ability to take our hardware, our box, and make it appear as many by creating layer two, three segments or partitions. And I'm going to go into this a little bit more, but <clears throat> to give you some idea, we can do up to 32 partitions on our entry level model and over a thousand on our high end models. So what are the benefits of this? Well, this is, a, this is an image of, uh, mind you, very rudimentary designed by sales, but uh, hopefully it'll get the point across here. Um, this is an image of a recent financial institution that we worked with downtown Chicago. And they, their incumbent vendor, uh, they were using two boxes for the external part of their network and two boxes for the internal part of their network. They wanted to add the capacity to do data center failover between their primary and their DR site. So they were looking to add global server load balancing, which is the red box up top. So in essence, that was a, a five box system for, in the primary, five box in their DR because they were using their DR as an active active site, it was a 10 system solution for them. What A10 can do with their layer three virtualization is we have the capacity to carve up the resources at layer two and layer three, and we can run the GSLB and the external part as well as the internal part on much fewer systems. So in our scenario, uh, we can do two systems at each of the sites for four system total. So you have a 10 box versus a four system box solution. Uh, tremendous TCO just in and of itself. But it actually goes even a step further in that the same customer this year wants to add web application firewall capabilities. So remember, as we talked earlier, we look at any time you have to expend capital and you have ongoing operational costs associated with that capital, we look at those as additional products. So in this case, they wanted to add web application firewall, so you had the five original boxes plus you'd have to have four more licenses, and then authentication or single sign-on capability would be two more. So in essence, you have 11 systems in your primary that you're responsible for managing, and you have 11 systems at your DR site, so now you're at 22 systems, if you will. Again, what, what uh, A10 allows us to do is to basically use the same boxes 
and apply those those uh, the WAF and the authentication and turn on those features basically on those two boxes. So we're now still staying with two systems at each location, so for a total of four systems. So you can see very quickly how the TCO model begins to add up. So from our perspective, the architecture, we increase the performance and the accuracy. We serve up a better end user experience. And certainly as there's more devices and things hitting our network, that's ultimately kind of the goal is being is, is serving up the business. Um, you know, the, uh, the BYOD, and as that continues to expand, more and more devices are hitting your network. How do you create uh, a better end user experience? Uh, the no licensing gives you a very predictable cost model. You know, we, we make it so you're able to manage your business, not your licenses. And then virtualization, you know, the optimize the system resources, you be able to do more with less. We allow you to enhance, streamline, and simplify, and ultimately it links to a very disruptive TCO model. So from a, this gives you kind of a quick snapshot of a lot of the platforms um, that we're talking about here today around uh, our Thunder series. Um, you'll see on the low end there, uh, the entry point, five gig system, all the platforms now have uh, multiple, at least two 10 gig ports, uh, and they move quickly up the food stack there. And really you can kind of see what, uh, what determines, um, you know, based on unique needs of the network, what determines what is important uh, for our customers helps with the sizing. Oftentimes in traditional kind of enterprise, uh, candidly, SSL uh, offload and connections per second seem to be the major uh, variable in determining the sizing. But you can get into situations where performance certainly is a requirement. Uh, the number of ports, be they uh, be a 10 gig or 40 gig or something along those lines, with the larger customers. Um, let's see. I mean, at this time, I mean, that, that's probably the high-level summary. I can't see if there's, I want to be able to open this up but not uh, lose anything. There we go. I don't know if there is any questions or there's a way to open it up to the, uh, to the group to see if there are any questions. There is a, um, a questions box that if anyone does have questions, they can type it into. So if you, if all the attendees um, did want to do that at this point, um, let's see. Doesn't look like there's any currently. Um, let's just wait a minute here, see if anyone does have any questions that they would like to ask. Yeah, and I'll highlight, I mean, what, what we typically do, I mean, this is, this is very much just kind of informational so you know what's out there, why, why we're seeing the success that we're seeing. Um, there's a different way of kind of skinning the cat, if you will. Um, candidly, where we find we have the most success is when we actually have the opportunity to talk with, uh, you know, clients that, and, and basically do a whiteboard session and overlay their network and what they're trying to accomplish. As I mentioned earlier, that the part that's unique about these platforms is they really are becoming multifunctional platforms. Uh, load balancing is a feature set inside of them, uh, where go back 10 years ago and it was, it was really all they did. Uh, now you've got uh, security elements that are tied to these platforms, um, you know, as, wrong, as well as uh, uh, things are around um, web application firewall authentication. Uh, single sign-on uh, and the like, and we have, a, we have a suite of things that we do around the SSL as well where we complement and work with vendors such as um, Palo Alto, FireEye, Juniper, and, things like, and companies along those lines um, to, uh, to serve up uh, more accurate and mitigate, uh, mitigate attacks. So it becomes more of a holistic discussion when we can put up on a board a customer's design and things that are important to them. 
Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Jay and Lynn. It doesn't look like we have any questions at this point, so appreciate the time that you've taken. Um, and if anyone does have any questions, please feel free um, to email me, uh, K-M-I-C-H-A-L-S-E-N at netrixllc.com. And again, thank you all for attending and to our presenters, and everyone have a great day. Thanks, Jay. Thank you all. Take care.